In the previous lecture, we introduced uh, a model for wireless transmission. In fact, if we go back, that we have a signal that we want to transmit from transmitter to receiver. And a simple model is we, we transmit an electrical signal with some power level, some strength. If you think of the sine wave as our signal, then the amplitude of that sine wave is the power. Okay, so that's the signal strength, how large it is. That's PT, we denote that power as. But we use antennas to convert that electrical signal to radio waves, or electromagnetic waves that propagate through the air. And we're talking about antennas, and we arrived at uh, some description of the antenna gain. We have the, the basic or the reference antenna called an isotropic antenna that when we transmit, the, the energy comes out of that an antenna and goes in all directions equally. Let's think of that's the perfect antenna. But in practice, we use directional antennas, even though we may be very close to an isotropic antenna. And the power is sometimes is concentrated in a particular direction. So instead of spreading equally in all directions, the power will be strong in one direction, weaker in another direction. And we talked about that if we measure in a particular direction our directional antenna versus the isotropic antenna, we can compare them. And we can say that the directional antenna has some gain compared to the isotropic antenna. So we talked about that concept and we, it's a key characteristic of antennas, the antenna gain, usually specified in the direction where it's stronger, strongest. Okay, so the gain changes in different locations for a particular antenna. But in that direction where the signal is strongest, we'll see a spec of that antenna is the antenna gain. Measured in dB, usually decibels, Decibels and the I indicates the decibels of our antenna relative to using an isotropic antenna. That's why we write it as dBi. We say we're comparing ours relative to some reference isotropic antenna. And we went through an example where we looked at two different points for our blue directional antenna. And this was a made up example for an antenna where we set up the red point, point X, if we used our black isotropic antenna, the signal strength received would be 10 milliwatts. Anywhere on the black circle, 10 milliwatts. If I use my blue directional antenna, the signal strength received, let's say we measured to be 70 milliwatts. So at that one point, our directional antenna is seven times stronger than the isotropic antenna. And that gives us the gain. A gain of 7, or in dB, 8.45 dBi. Just the conversion of logarithm times by 10. And we could think for my blue directional antenna, this is a, a part of the spec for that antenna. When I go looking to buy one, I see uh, this antenna has a gain of 8.45 dBi. We'll see how we'll use that later. But in fact, the antenna in different directions has different gains. So we looked at the point behind the antenna, at point Y. On the black circle, the measured received power would be 10 milliwatts for the isotropic antenna. But with our blue directional antenna, on that same point, PY, let's say we measured it to be 2 milliwatts, then our gain is 0.2. It's in fact a loss. The signal strength of our antenna compared to an isotropic antenna is less than the isotropic antenna. 2 divided by 10, 0 0.2 or minus 7 dBi. And if we measured at other points one meter away, we could determine the gain. So usually for an antenna we list at least the maximum gain like in the direction with the maximum signal strength. And sometimes we'll see pictures that show the gain in different directions, called antenna patterns.
And I'll show you a few examples of them. Where? Cisco is a company that makes computer networking equipment. And they make and sell some antennas. And the reason I'm going to their web page is they have a nice web page that describes what are antennas, especially related to Wi-Fi. So they have this guide on antennas. And of importance for us, they list the specs of their antennas. So I'll just show you some examples. And I've just scrolled down to the, the actual specs. Maybe I'm at the wrong point. Uh, so they show some of the antennas that they sell and some of the, the specifications for them. So this first one is called a, a dipole antenna. Antennas have different shapes, shapes and sizes. And the shape and size impacts upon the maximum gain and also the direction where the gain is strongest. So this dipole antenna is one of the stick antennas stuck on the access point on the wall. It has two dipole antennas. It has a maximum gain of 2.2 dBi. So that's typical for those uh, access point antennas. And if we scroll down a bit, we see that that antenna, the maximum gain is 2.2 dBi, but in different directions it would have a different gain. And the way that the specs capture that is via these two plots here. It's hard to draw in 3D, so we draw two different plots, one for each of the different planes. So the azimuth plane is the direction if we go on the horizontal plane around us. Elevation plane is up and down. So think that if we look, if we have this antenna and we look in front of it, to the left, to the right, behind, and we measure the gain at points around it, then this red plot shows us approximately in all directions going around that antenna, the signal strength or the gain is about the same. We'll see some different ones later. So the, the gain, we're not going to ask you to read these in an exam or a quiz, but just to explain uh, antenna gain. This is showing that the gain in all directions, all 360 degrees around that antenna, is about the same. But if you look up and down from that antenna, if you have the antenna here and you look direct in front versus up, the way to interpret this blue plot is that direct in front is this zero degrees here. As we go up to maybe uh, 30 degrees, the antenna gain directly in front is about the same as 30 degrees up. But as we go up to say 60 degrees at this point, if you measure the same distance away, the gain will be less, the way that it's coming in. And if you measure directly above that antenna, the gain will be very small. That's what this plot shows. So directly below the antenna at this point indicates that the gain is very small. This shows the gain in two dimensions on two different plots. If you combine it, what sort of shape do you get if you try and draw this as three dimensions? And maybe you have it on your slides. A donut. Okay. You can imagine that in all directions around it's the same, but and up in that direction is about the same, but if you go directly above it, it's very weak. So it sort of creates a hole just above it and just below it. And it sort of becomes a donut type shape if you combine them. So that's the, the characteristics of a typical antenna on an access point. Most antennas are designed to work at a range, a specific range of frequencies. So this one is for 2.4 gigahertz. The typical Wi-Fi frequencies, it's a Wi-Fi antenna. And there may be other characteristics. Let's look at some more. Just another dipole antenna. Let's find some different ones. Different shape antenna, a monopole, different design. 
uh, same gain, maximum gain of 2.2 dBi, but the shape, and it's hard to see it, they've superimposed the red and the blue on the one plot, but the, the shape is slightly different uh, in terms of the, the radiation pattern. It's not necessarily a donut type shape. It, it's uh, in one particular direction, it's a bit stronger than behind. That one's hard to see with a single plot. We'll find another one. A 5 dBi sector antenna. Larger maximum gain. So the shape of this antenna. The sector antenna implies that it's, you stick it in a location and it tries to cover a particular sector, say, of a, of a circle. Rather than covering all 360 degrees, maybe it covers 60 or 120 degrees of that circle with a strong signal and the other parts a weak signal. And if we look at the antenna pattern, on the azimuth plane we can think directly in front, strong signal, strong high gain, and maybe across these 120 degrees the signal is strong, but if you measure behind the antenna, here, the gain is much lower. So behind, the, gain, the signal will be weak. It's designed to concentrate the power in a particular sector of our circle. And the elevation is slightly different. In front, uh, uh, so, sorry, in front, and then if you follow up and around, uh, it will get weak as you go up and down, similar to our dipole. So antennas have different shapes, different designs to try to cover different areas. A sector antenna is commonly used in mobile phone base stations. There's an antenna that points and covering these 120 degrees of the city and then another sector antenna for the, another 120 degrees, for example. A couple more, that's a different shape. Let's go down. A 6 dBi wall mount antenna, similarly you stick it on the wall and it tries to cover a particular direction. Again, tries to concentrate narrowly in one direction. So if we stick this wall mount antenna uh, on the wall here, we could select the antenna such that it will try and cover where everyone's sitting. It doesn't need to propagate a signal out that direction because no one sits over there in the room. So we could choose an antenna to cover the area we want to cover. And if we go up at a larger antenna, 8.5 dBi, different type, 10 dBi antenna, <coughs> And I think one 12 dBi antenna. Essentially all directions around, about the same gain, but very focused in this direction. That is, if you go up a little bit, the signal will be very weak. If you go down a little bit, the signal will be weak. But in this maybe 15, 20 degrees, the signal will be very strong. There's a very high gain. And you can use such antennas to cover a large distance. You point this antenna at the similar antenna at the other location, and as long as they are aligned, then they should be able to communicate across a large distance. They need to be aligned because if they're not aligned, they're not pointing at each other, the signal strength may not be large enough to be able to communicate. So the more concentrated the energy is, the higher the directionality of that antenna, the more you need to align it to point to the receiver so that they can communicate. And I think that's all. Uh, a couple of others. 14 dBi. And I just scroll down to a couple more. Where, where, where? Mm. 
back to a, a dipole. This is 3.5 dBi. The only difference mainly, this is designed for a frequency of about 5 gigahertz, 5.1 to 5.8 gigahertz. What is that frequency range commonly used for? About 5 gigahertz. Anyone? What do you use it for? We use it, or some of you may use it sometimes, maybe not so often, but you, maybe your device supports it. It's another Wi-Fi frequency. Wi-Fi is commonly, very common in the 2.4 gigahertz range, but there's another frequency band of about 5 gigahertz. So if you've got a new phone or especially an access point, this one doesn't, but a newer access point that will allow you to support either 2.4 or 5. It has diff different characteristics. Maybe the, the practical benefits of 5 gigahertz is there's less people using that frequency and less interference, but sometimes less range. Depends on your wireless device that will support both. So just some examples of antenna patterns and, and real antennas. And a, a few more on the slides, just the, the 3D and also the antenna pattern plots. <coughs> Any questions on antennas? So we looked at the gain and we calculated in our example the gain, it was say 70 milliwatts divided by 10 milliwatts. The problem with this approach is for me to know the gain of my blue antenna, I need to use my antenna and also use an isotropic antenna and measure the signal strength at the same location. What we would like is to be able to predict the gain before I build it. This requires measurements to know the gain. A designer of the antenna wants to be able to design one and, and predict what would the gain be, especially in different directions. So this approach is not practical to find the gain when you, someone designs or, uh, an antenna. Because it involves it being built and compared to an isotropic antenna. It turns out there is a mathematical relationship between the gain and the effective area of an antenna. And that's given by this equation. We'll explain effective area in the moment, but it's, it's related to the physical area of the antenna. So the gain is equal to 4 pi times by the effective area of the antenna, something to do with the size of the antenna, divided by the wavelength squared. So the gain depends upon the, the really the size of the antenna and the frequency that we use in the signal being transmitted by that antenna. If you increase the size, does the gain go up or down? You, with all other conditions the same, increase the size of the antenna, put your hands up if the gain goes up. Increase the size, does the gain go up or down? Hands up for up. Hands up for down. If the size goes up, the area is going to go up. So the, air, the effective area, we'll explain a little bit more in a moment, but the effective area is related to the the, the how much area that, that antenna component covers. So it depends upon the size. So generally a good rule to remember if the antenna size goes up, AE will go up and G will go up. The bigger the antenna, the bigger the gain. What if the frequency goes up? We transmit a signal with a higher frequency. What happens to the gain? For example, we saw with Wi-Fi there's 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz. If we change from 2.4 up to 5 gigahertz, we'll, with the same sized antenna, 
Will the gain go up or down? Frequency up, what happens to the gain? Hands up for up. Frequency up, gain. Mm, some uncertain hands. Anyone have an answer? Remember, frequency and wavelength are inversely proportional. Wavelength, lambda, equals the speed of light divided by the frequency. So if frequency goes up, wavelength goes down. If wavelength lambda goes down, we divide by a smaller number, g will go up. Higher frequency, higher gain. if all the other conditions are the same. Lambda is the, the signal wavelength, so <coughs> if we know the signal frequency, we can find the wavelength. What about the effective area? What does that mean? AE is what we denote as the effective area. It's related to the physical size. But antennas, we saw, have many different shapes. So sometimes it's hard to measure the physical size of the actual antenna component. So we don't have an easy equation to calculate the effective area. It differs. So we need to know something about the internals of the antenna design to know the effective area. But we can approximate for some antennas. A parabolic dish antenna. I think we showed in a previous lecture those like satellite receiving antennas that are dish shaped. Maybe if you have satellite TV or satellite internet or you uh, have seen uh, the, the receivers, the big dish shaped receivers. The shape is a, it's a parabolic antenna. If you look at that dish, then the area is about, it's approximately the area of a circle. Okay? It's circular shape but it, it dips in the middle. But if you look front on, the area is about that of a circle. So the physical area of a parabolic antenna is approximately pi r squared. If we have a dish which is one meter in diameter, the radius is 50 centimeters, the area is about pi times 50 or 0 0.5 squared in terms of meters squared. That's the physical area. The effective area, it depends actually on the design, the components and, and how it's built as to what the effective area is. But commonly, it's about half of the physical area. Okay. In an exam, I may, I may tell you, I may say, assume the effective area is 0 0.5 times the physical area. But I'd need to tell you that. Okay. So it may differ on different antennas. We may use that in an example shortly. So if we know the physical area, we can often determine the effective area. And then from that, we can, if we know the signal frequency, we can determine the gain of that antenna. And that's useful to know in, in our subsequent analysis. <coughs> We will do a, f a couple of calculations with that uh, towards the end today. So that's about antennas. The next thing is about how does our signal travel between transmit antenna and receive antenna? How does it propagate? And then how much power do we lose? We'll talk about those two things. How does a signal propagate? If I transmit a signal, let's say I turned off the microphone and I talk, we can think the signal goes, it spreads out and propagates almost directly but in different directions towards your ears. Well, it turns out there are different ways at which signals propagate, especially when we transmit across long distances at some of the lower frequencies. Some which we... Uh, which we don't, may not see so often in this course, but are important to mention.
the way that a signal moves depends upon the, the frequency of the signals and it depends upon the obstacles in the way or nearby, whether it will pass through different obstacles and the way that it reflects off different obstacles. So there are three main propagation models, two on this slide, ground wave, sky wave, and on the next slide we'll see line of sight. And the first two we'll mention quickly, but we'll not see very common in this course, are especially relevant when we're transmitting a long distance, thousands of kilometers, a wireless signal. If we're sending a signal with a frequency below 2 megahertz, so under 2 megahertz, it turns out when we transmit the signal, the signal uh, due to the, the magnetic field of the Earth changes speed. There's some pressure on the, the signal and it changes the speed and also the impacts of the atmosphere or ionosphere causes that signal to effectively bend around the curvature of the Earth. What that means, or what this picture is trying to show, the black line is the Earth. We have two antennas, a transmit and receive antenna, let's say uh, several thousand kilometers away from each other. Normally, uh, if we try to send a signal straight through from one to another, it would be obstructed by the Earth. We cannot go through the Earth, the signal will not propagate very well. But if we use below 2 megahertz, the signal bends around the Earth. It follows the, the curvature of the Earth, meaning that even if there are obstacles in the way, such as the Earth itself, the signal can still be propagated to the receiver. Ground wave propagation allows us to communicate across long distances and used in AM radio. Okay. Similar, but for frequencies from 2 up to 30 megahertz is sky wave propagation. It allows us to cover long distances, but there's different characteristics here. The signal is really transmitted up and it hits the ionosphere. And uh, the nature of the ionosphere is that the frequency at those uh, 2 to 30 megahertz, the signals bounce off, they reflect. And they come down to Earth and bounce back up and keep going. And again allows us to transmit across a very long distance, really covering around the Earth. And this is commonly used in international radio stations. Short wave radio, sometimes it's called. You can pick up radio stations from Europe, maybe from America, because the signal propagates around in this, this uh, reflection type uh, mode. In our data communications like Wi-Fi, uh, mobile phone systems and others we will see with data links, usually we use higher frequencies than 30 megahertz. So these two don't apply, mainly for radio communications like AM or shortwave radio. So what does apply for higher than 30 megahertz? What we call line of sight. The transmit and receive antenna must be able to see each other. By seeing, imagine you stand at the transmit antenna and if you had perfect eyesight, you should be able to see the receive antenna. In particular, the antennas cannot be spread so far such that the curvature of the Earth means that the Earth is an obstacle in between them. If we bring the antennas around, they'll be obstructed by the Earth. So in line of sight is the common model that we will use. It doesn't mean that we can't have no obstructions. It just means that the signal effectively goes straight, line of sight communications. It doesn't curve around the earth. So with Wi-Fi we consider it line of sight in this mode. Even though we don't have to physically see the receiver, there can be a wall, but the signal goes straight in that case. And that's the mode we will see commonly.
there's a, there are other aspects on how the signal propagates, whether it's obstructed by water, uh, by di different temperatures, and so on. So some signals cannot be successfully received at different times of the day, at night or during the day, because they're impacted by temperature, uh, by, by um, uh, the atmosphere. What we want to concentrate on now is when we transmit a signal, how much power is lost between the transmitter and receiver? How much is the signal attenuated? So let's analyze that. First, we'll talk about a general model for how we can compare uh, signal strength at the transmitter and receiver in terms of a wireless transmission. We transmit a signal with some power, PT. The transmit antenna has a gain. And we think of that gain as like in any gain, it multiplies the signal strength. If I transmit at 100 milliwatts and the gain is a factor of two, then you can think what comes out of the antenna is 200 milliwatts. It's a gain, it's a multiplier. As the signal comes out of the transmitting antenna, the signal gets weaker. We said attenuation means the signal as it travels some distance always gets weaker. By how much we care about. And at this stage we'll denote by how much is the loss, L, or the path loss to be specific. L means, in this equation, means if L is uh, 50, it means from the transmitter to the receiver, the received signal will be 50 times weaker than the transmitted signal. So the loss is by how, how much do we lose the power. So we can think we transmit a strong signal, it gets weaker as it travels some distance, it's received by the receive antenna, and then that receive antenna also has a gain. It effectively amplifies the signal. And the result, the result after that receive antenna, is what we receive the power as, PR. Mathematically, we can think we transmit a power at power level PT, the transmit antenna introduces a gain of GT, a multiplier. The receive antenna also introduces a ga gain of GR, another multiplier. And the path loss is captured by the parameter L. That reduces the signal strength, so we divide by L. The result is the receive power, PR. A quick example, <coughs> transmit one watt We know the antenna characteristics, let's say the gain, not in dB, the absolute values. Let's just make some easy numbers, is 100. And the receive antenna has a gain of 50. That is the transmit antenna compared to an isotropic antenna gives a signal which is 100 times stronger. The receive antenna is, has a signal which is 50 times stronger. Let's say we know the loss is a factor of 1,000. So we can think we transmit a signal, and I cannot draw it to scale. We start with a transmitted signal 
the transmitting antenna introduces a gain, so it increases the signal strength. Then there's a loss, so that as the signal propagates, it gets weaker and weaker by a factor of 1,000. So this is the gain of the transmit antenna. This is the loss. We start with the transmit power. There's a gain according to the transmit antenna. The signal loses power across distance. Then it's received and the receiving antenna introduces a gain which amplifies again. And what we receive here is the receive power, PR. What are we, whatever we end up with is the receive power strength. What is the receive power strength? What is PR in this example? Well, these are absolute values, so PR is our transmit power, 1 watt, times by the gains, no units, divided by the loss. I didn't choose very, num very good numbers. Normally the loss will be much larger. Let me fix that. Let's add a zero here. So I just made up some numbers. Typically the loss in many wireless systems we'll see is very high compared to the other factors, but not always. So we transmit at one watt. The total gain from the antennas is 100 times 50, or 5,000. The total signal strength lost as it propagates through the air is a factor of 10,000. So we end up at the receiver with half a watt. This, in this case, I assumed I knew the transmit power, I knew the characteristics of the antenna gains, and let's say I measured the loss, the, how much power was lost, 10,000, then I could calculate the received power. We'll go through another example in a moment. These values, the gains are in the absolute values, not dB. Don't use the dB value here for the antenna gain, for example. But we can easily convert to dB. Remember dB, logarithm in base 10, multiplied by 10. And if you do that on this equation, on both sides you take the logarithm and then multiply by 10, then really because the logarithm of two numbers multiplied together is the same as the adding of the log of those two numbers together, and dividing by becomes subtraction, what we get is that the received power measured in dB is the transmit power measured in dB plus the gains in dB minus the loss in dB. So if our values are expressed in, on the decibel scale, we can use this approach, sometimes easier. So let's go through another example that uh, uses some different values and also combine back to uh, the loss and distance in a moment. Maybe first. New example. Let's consider an example of using Wi-Fi. The scenario is I've got uh, 
Uh, my, um, I've got two endpoints I want to connect together. I've got two wireless devices, Wi-Fi devices. I'm going to use 2.4 gigahertz as the frequency. What I'd like to know is how far apart can I separate those devices such that they can still communicate? Let's say I put one Wi-Fi device here at SIT or on the roof. Then I'd like to know, well, how far away can I go such that my other device, the receiver, can still communicate with my transmitter? What's the distance that we can achieve? Let's try and consider that by using some realistic examples for Wi-Fi. The scenario may be you're living out in the country and you want to connect your house to your friend's house. And to connect them, you're going to use an access point like the one on the wall. You have one at your friend's house, one at your house, and you set them up in a mode so that they talk to each other. We'd like to know, well, how far apart could they be such that they can still communicate? Here's an access point that we'll use. We have a few of these downstairs, or, or in, the, in the network lab actually, in the other building. Uh, just some newer access points than the ones on the wall. So let's look at the specs. Somewhere, where are they? Here they are. All right, the specs of the data rates, uh, the, actually the, the wired data rates up to 1,000 megabits per second on the wired ports. Let's focus on the wireless features. This access point supports the two different frequency bands available for Wi-Fi, 2.4 gigahertz and the 5 gigahertz. Sometimes you'll see the, the precise names like IEEE 802.11 B, G, N, A, C, A. They refer to different standards for how Wi-Fi works. Data rates, here denoted as signal rate, for 2.4 gigahertz goes up to 450 megabits per second. 1.3 gigabits per second if you use 5 gigahertz. For our example, what's important is, first we'll go to transmit power. When we transmit a signal, what's the power of that signal? Well, it says if you transmit a signal with this access point, if you're in Europe, so the standard in Europe, CE and other <laughs> regions, is if you're using the 2.4 gigahertz frequency range, you can go up to 20 dBm. 20 dBm is 100 milliwatts. You convert back to milliwatts, which you know from your quiz, is 100 milliwatts. If you use 5 gigahertz, you can go slightly higher. 40, uh, 200 milliwatts. If you're in the US, the US standards, they control how much you can transmit at maximum power levels, goes up to, uh, what, 1,000 milliwatts, or one watt. Let's use the 20 dBm value as the transmit power. We'll use that in our example. Our device can transmit at 20 dBm. What the other thing we need to know is when we receive a signal, what is the weakest signal that that device can understand? And that's often referred to as the receiver sensitivity, reception sensitivity here. Let's focus on 2.4 gigahertz. We'll use that in the example. If I transmit a signal from one of these access points to another, then the receiver is designed such that if the signal received is greater than minus 77 dBm, if we're using this particular standard at 54 megabits per second, if the received power is greater than this, my device receives successfully. If the received power is less than minus 77 dBm, you think it cannot hear it, you cannot receive it. And it differs depending upon the standards and, and the frequencies as to what this received sensitivity is. Think of it as the lowest power we can successfully receive. Let's remember this one, minus 77 dBm. 
we'll need it to work out uh, how much loss we can tolerate between transmitter and receiver. Let's write down those values. <coughs> We've got our access point at one location. Say that, think of that as the transmitter and some other location we want to have the receiver. Same access point. And we know the characteristics. This one has a transmit power. Let's set it to 20 dBm. And this one, when it receives a signal, the smaller signal it can successfully receive, we'll denote as PR, the minimum value of PR we can tolerate is minus 77 dBm. <coughs> what we would like to know is how much loss can we have between the two devices? How much power can we lose such that the signal strength will still be greater than minus 77 dBm? So we'll try and determine the loss. The frequency we're assuming is 2.4 gigahertz. The next thing we need to know is about the antennas. What's the gain of the antennas on these devices? I'm not sure if it's specified on the web page. Sometimes it says, sometimes not. I think in this case it doesn't show us the antenna gain. But we may guess. I've got one of these devices. The antennas are slightly bigger than those dipoles on the access point. But let's assume that they're still about the 2.2 dBi. Okay. I think they may be a little bit larger uh, gain. But let's to, to give it a number. Uh, the antennas, doesn't matter that there are three. We just focus on the gain of a single antenna. Let's set it to be about the same as the one on the wall, which I know is 2.2 dBi. And at the transmitter and receiver, they are the same. Same device. So we can say the gain of the transmit antenna, like that first Cisco antenna, 2.2 dBi, and the gain of the receive antenna is the same. They don't have to be the same. You can have different antennas at, at the transmitter and receiver and they can have different gains. Just in this case they turn out to be the same. What is the maximum loss that we can tolerate such that these two devices can still communicate? Find the maximum loss in dB. We transmit at 20 dBm, there's a gain of 2.2 dBi, then we lose some power. Then there's a gain of 2.2 dBi at the receive antenna and we must receive at a power of at least minus 77 dBm. So how much power can we lose such that the receive power is minus 77 dBm? What's L? Note that all of the values that we saw in the spec or the transmit and receive power also for the antenna gains are in the dB scale, decibels. So use this equation. Don't convert them to milliwatts, absolute values, that's too hard. Just use the equation here, which will give you the same answer but faster.
I will not write the notation or the subscript of dB. We just PR measured in dB is PT plus GT plus GR minus L. But be careful, all of these values are, must be expressed in the decibel form. So we want to find L, rearrange. If we rearrange, we can calculate the loss. And we know those four values. PT is 20 dBm. GT is 2.2 dBi, so is GR. Minus, minus 77 dBm. This is why it's sometimes useful to use the values in dB. Most of the specs for equipment will be expressed in dB, and then just adding and subtracting is quite easily. 22.2, 24.2 plus 77 uh, is 101.2 dBm. Hundred one point four DB, not DBM. Just add them up. <coughs> I'll let people catch up and write that down, and then we'll answer some questions about it. the common question that comes up now, how did you add up these numbers when you've got dBm, dBi, and how did you end up with dB? Okay, that's strange. The important point to remember is dB is not our normal unit. It's a measure of the scale that we use. If you think about the units, what are the units for power? Watts. Power transmit, power receive, watts, or with a prefix of milliwatts. The units for loss and the gains, there are no units. They're dimensionless. They're ratios or factors. So even though we write dBi and dBm, we can still add them up in this because they, because we in dB scale, we can add the factor in. The I just means relative to isotropic. So don't be confused and think that Oh, we somehow need to change dBm into dBi. No. The transmit power measures watts. Receive power measures watts. In this case, it's milliwatts and milliwatts. The others are just factors or ratios. And because we're on a logarithmic scale, we can add them together. If you don't understand that, then convert them all to the absolute values. Convert to milliwatts and back to the uh, absolute values and do the multiplication and division and you'll see you'll get the same answer. Loss, gain, uh, really measured in dB, there is, if we convert back to the absolute value, there are no units in them. So what does this number tell us? It means, if I transmit a signal from my access point, if there's a loss of 101.4 dB, or we can convert that back to the normal value, the absolute value is 10 to the power of 10.14. 
not in dB. Remember, the, we divide by 10, 10 to the power of, or take the logarithm of this value and then times by 10 to get dB. So this is the inverse operation. What does it tell us? The signal coming out of the transmit antenna, if it loses its power by a factor of 10 to the power of 10.14, which is what? About 10 billion. If it loses the power such that the, receive, the signal going into the receive antenna is 10 billion times smaller than the one coming out of the transmit antenna, then with the gain of the receiver we will receive a power of minus 77 dBm. And the spec of my equipment said if I can receive minus 77 dBm it will work okay. If it was less it would not work. So we've determined what's the maximum loss we can tolerate such that these two devices can communicate. Questions on this so far? Why do we care about loss? What do we want to know? I want to know how far apart I can put them. What distance can I separate them by such that they'll communicate? Well, it turns out if we know the loss, there are some relationships between loss and distance. So we can use some models to find out, well, if the loss is 101.4 dB, what distance does that correspond to? Let's go to that now. So we'll continue that example and, and convert it to distance. And there are different ways to relate loss and distance. It depends. It depends upon the obstacles between the transmitter and receiver. The walls, whether the signals bounce off walls, whether there are people in between, trees and many other factors. But we'll start with a very simple model. In the ideal case, assuming there are no obstacles, we're operating in perfect conditions. We say in free space. Imagine we're out in space, nothing in between transmit and receiver. Then the ideal model is referred to this free space path loss equation, which says the loss is equal to 4 times pi times the distance divided by the wavelength, all squared. We know what the loss we can tolerate. We know L. We can find the wavelength because we know the frequency. Therefore, we can find D, the distance that our two devices can separate by. Let's do that now. Use this equation to find D. The free space path loss model tells us loss not in dB. Be careful. L here is not measured in dB. It's the absolute value. Equals 4 pi d divided by lambda all squared. What's lambda? We'll need that. What was our frequency? 2.4 gigahertz. So we can calculate the wavelength. Let's do it here. Lambda equals the speed of light divided by frequency. What's the speed of light? 300 million meters per second. 3 by 10 to the 8 meters per second. The speed of light is about 300 million meters per second. Nice one to remember. The frequency is 2.4 gigahertz, so 2.4 by 10 to the power of 9 
hertz or times per second. Calculator time. Effectively, 3 divided by 24. 300 million divided by 2.4 billion is 0 0.125 meters. That's our wavelength. We know L, it's 10 to the power of 10.14. We know lambda, it's 0 0.125. Let's find D. And it's just a matter of rearranging this. If you rearrange, what do you get? D, the distance, is the square root of L, square root of L. Let's write that bit better. The square root of the loss times by lambda divided by 4p, 4 pi. I will not write down the numbers, we'll calculate direct. The square root of, do we have 10 to the power of 10.14? That was a loss, not in dB, but in the absolute value. Times by the wavelength, 0.125. Divide by 4 and divide by pi. 1,168 meters is the distance. One thousand one hundred sixty-nine if we round up to an integer. So what does this number tell us now? We've got two of these uh, TP-Link access points, the so one on the web page, one at your home, one at your friend's home. We know the specs of the transmit power and the minimum receive power, PT and PT PR. We assume the antennas had a gain of 2.2 dBi, that's a good assumption. When we transmit a signal with a frequency of 2.4 gigahertz, we've used our mathematical models, in particular the free space path loss, assuming there are no obstacles in a perfect environment, we've determined that we can separate them by 1,169 meters. If we separate them by, say, 1,200 meters, <coughs> we would transmit a signal the gains of the antenna and the loss across that distance would be such that the received power would be less than our minus 77 dBm. So greater than this distance, if the distance goes up, the loss goes up, and it means the received power will go down. And the threshold for our received power is the minus 77 dBm. So your friend can be 1,169 meters away if you want to communicate with these two access points. Any questions? Okay. 
It's not finished time yet. Yep. Yes, the lambda is the speed of light divided by the frequency, 3 by 10 to the power of 8 divided by 2.4 by 10 to the power of 9. Yep. The gigahertz, giga. You need to uh, learn some of my writing, especially the number of 9. Okay. Is this realistic? This says not just if we're going to our friend's house, but if you have your wireless device, this access point, and your laptop, if it had a similar antenna and similar characteristics, you could separate them by about one kilometre and still have Wi-Fi access. Do you think it's realistic? Or another way, do you think you can communicate with this access point in this room if you're one kilometre away? Most likely not. In reality, we have many obstacles between the transmitter and receiver. Even if there were no walls, we're out in an open field, the atmosphere has some impact upon the attenuation and it's not as good as this. This is the best case result if we're out in space with no obstacles. So we call it the free space path loss model. In reality, it's going to be less than this. But this gives us an approximate value if we're, say, in an open field but not very good if we're indoors. Walls cause big problems. There are other models, other equations that try to approximate if we're inside. In this course, I think we will not see them, but the free space path loss model is quite easy, this equation. There are others. There's some for inside a city with the different obstructions and different reflections. There's some for TV broadcasts, say from a TV station to your home. And there's some for indoor modelling, that is when there are walls and ceilings and so on to try to accurately model how far can we transmit to produce a particular uh, path loss. Let's stick with free space path loss for now. I have a problem. My friend is 20 kilometres away from me, not one kilometre. All right, his house is a long way away. How can I communicate with him using the same access points? We've bought the access points. Okay, we went out and bought them. We want to set up a link between our two homes, but they are 20 kilometres away from each other. What do we do? What could we do to still communicate? I can't move my home. What could I do? I need to communicate with my friend via Wi-Fi. I must have a solution. What do you propose? Do you, you get a job as an IT specialist and you set up Wi-Fi networks. What do you tell me? Or what do you sell me as a solution? Move closer, no. Bigger antennas. Okay, remember that our calculations was that, so one thing that we can change quite easily usually is the antennas. The antennas introduce a gain. A bigger antenna, a bigger gain. Bigger gain means that under the same conditions, the receive power will be greater. If we amplify more, the receive power will be larger. And in fact, most of these access points, the antennas screw off. So you can take them off and you can attach a bigger antenna. And you can buy bigger antennas. Let's try a calculation to finish today. Let's keep everything the same. Same transmit power, same frequency, same receive threshold. But let's change the antennas. And let's say now, uh, we use a big dish antenna.
Let's see if it works. Both the transmit and receive antenna, let's remove the, the dipole antennas and attach a dish antenna which is a 50 centimeter diameter antenna we buy, parabolic dish, so we need to point it at the dish at the receiving end. We set them up, we want to know can we make the distance of 20 kilometers if we buy these two antennas. So let's assume just for simplicity the antennas are the same at both transmit and receiver. So we only have to do one calculation. So if I know my dish is a diameter of 50 centimetres, what do I do next? What's the gain of that dish? We have a way to relate the antenna size, the frequency or wavelength, and the gain. Let's assume that we have our parabolic antenna, we know the radius is 25 centimetres, the diameter is 50 centimetres. Let's assume that the, it's a circle, it's not quite a circle, the area, the, it, it's not a, not a flat circle. But let's assume it's a circle, so the area is pi r squared. And let's assume, just for this calculation, the effective area is half of pi r squared. That would depend upon the actual design of the antenna but it's a good assumption. Given that, we'll use this equation to find our antenna gain. <coughs> the, the area is pi r squared. What's the radius in meters? 0.25. Note that we use meters here, convert to meters. Everything it would be in the standard units. That's the area, and let's say that the effective area is half of that in the equation. The area of our dish is pi times 0 0.25 squared. The effective area for the antenna calculation is half of that our antenna gain four pi AE divided by lambda squared. We know lambda, we calculated before it's zero point one two five. We can plug in the value for AE to get the gain G of our antenna. Okay, AE is a half of A, A is pi times 0 0.25 squared. I'll plug them in into the calculator and find the value. Four times pi, effective area is a half times A, A is pi times 0.25 squared, so let's just times it twice, divided by the wavelength squared. Wavelength from before was 0 0.125, the power of 2. Just plug in the values. 79, about. We get a gain of about 79. We'll write that down in a moment. And if we want to express in dBi, we can log that and times by 10. Or about 19 dBi. 79 as the absolute value, as the multiplier, or 19 dBi is our parabolic dish antenna. which is the same as 19, approximately, dBi.
Our dipole antennas were 2.2. We've changed the antennas. We're up to 19 dBi. For simplicity, let's say the antennas are the same at the transmitter and receiver. If they were different, we'd need to calculate the gain separately. What's our loss now? The transmit power, 20 dBm, plus the gain of the transmit antenna, 19 dBi, plus the gain of the receive antenna, also 19 dBi, minus our minus 77 dBm. Anyone can calculate for me? Hundred and thirty five DB. Convert to the absolute value. Ten to the power of thirteen point five. We know the loss now. What's the distance from before? We're just using the same equations, but different values this time. Square root of 10 to the power of 13.5, our loss, times by our wavelength. 0.125 divided by 4 divided by pi. Did I get that right? 55,000, 56,000 meters. Our distance is about 56 kilometers. By increasing the antenna gain, using different antennas in this case, they have a larger gain, we'll have, we can tolerate a larger loss to receive at the same power, or in other words, we can transmit across a larger distance to re still receive at minus 77 dBm. So we achieve our link between our two friends. Check the calculations of those, okay, we will summarize in the next lecture and move on and finish on this wireless transmission so you should be able to do some calculations of path loss, antenna gains and similar. We'll continue tomorrow.